Welcome back to our next session on RAG evaluation. Everybody asks, how do I evaluate RAG systems? Here's your answer. So today we're going to align our aim to evaluate RAG systems using best practice open source tooling and improve RAG systems quantitatively using some advanced retrieval processes. Quick overview of what we're going through. We're going to review RAG, build a meta RAG, assess some RAG, take R to the next level in RAG. We're going to do RAG. Yes. A couple of links for you guys. You can check these out right now. bit.ly slash aimrag, tinyurl.com slash evalrag. These are the things that uh, we've already shown some of today. We're going to keep showing the rest right now. So just recall open source RAG, what we're talking about, query, embedding model, vector DB, prompt template. Go ahead and put that context in there. Everything gets shoved into the chat model. Boom, you got your answer. Okay, cool. Now, we have this. If we focus on the models we're using for open source, we talked about leveraging BGE base, and we've seen how we can leverage new researches, Llama 27B chat model from Hugging Face, by doing a little bit of setup work at the beginning. So we basically have the setup. BG base, Llama 2 from new research, chat model 7B on Hugging Face. So we're gonna set up, quick, set up a quick flow where we're gonna do rag on rag, AKA meta rag. We're gonna search for the top five papers on rag. We're gonna convert those papers to embeddings put them in a vector store, ask specific questions related to the content, and return answers. We've already seen this before. Looks something like this. But we want to actually be able to ask now, what is RAG? And we want the RAG system to answer it. So with that, let's set up our meta RAG. Over to you, Chris. All right, we are going to meta RAG. So this is where we're going to RAG on RAG, as Greg said. Uh, Straightforward enough. It's exactly what we've seen before, but using some, uh, you know, different abstractions. So first, we're going to grab our dependencies. Next, we are going to provide our OpenAI uh, API key. And then we are going to load our archive loader from our document loaders. We've seen this before. It lets us query uh, archive for papers that uh, match this, que uh, this query by relevance. We're going to load five of them. And there we can see we have these five papers. Then we're going to create a naive index where we chunk those papers by uh, with the recursive character text splitter with chunk size 500. We're going to split them there. And then we're going to store them in a chroma vector DB using OpenAI's embeddings. So you can see that we have 1,000 chunks uh, from our five papers that are stored in our index. Then we're going to create a QA from retrieval chain, which is going to be this retrieval QA from chain type. We're going to give our primary QA LLM, which is just going to be GBT 3.5 Turbo 16K. We're going to use our Chroma DB vector store as a retriever. We're going to pass in these search quarks, which is going to let us select our k to be three, which means that every query query will retrieve the top three of our 1,061 documents. And we're going to have them return source documents. Then we can ask the question, what is RAG? We can send that in as our query, and we'll get a result. RAG stands for Retrieval Augmented Gen Generation. It is a framework that combines retrieval-based models with generation, but it goes on and on to explain ra RAG. And that's all we have to do. Um, you know, this is the this is the whole thing. Uh, you can access the notebook with the bit.ly that uh, Greg mentioned, or you can check it out here. Uh, but yes, that's all we need to do in order to do rag on rag. We'll kick it back to Greg. Nice rag on rag. What's next? Well, how did we do? Let's talk about how we can evaluate this rag system now. When we think about evaluation 
We should be thinking about evaluation feedback loops. We should be thinking about how we're actually going to improve our system as we continue to do more REC. And as we sit there, now that we have it instrumented, what should we be measuring? What should we be trying? How should we be tinkering and tuning this thing as we go? Well, the answer isn't clear for any given application space. The method for baselining how good your system is, at least relative to how good it might be after you start changing stuff, that is more clear. When we do RAG evaluation with the RAGIS or RAG assessment framework, we want to think about it by breaking it up into four different pieces. The first is the question. That's the query. What are we asking this thing? The second is the answer. What's it given back? The third is the retrieved context. That's the context that we pulled out of the vector DB and we passed in to the LLM through the prompt. Finally, the ground truth here is very important. The ground truth is, just as the name would imply, the ground truth answer. Now, it's important to note here that when we talk about ground truth answers, those are generally going to truly be something that probably should come from a human. What should the right answer be that is good, correct, or enough for this particular query, given all of this context? What would a human respond with, given question and access to all of this data? That might be the real ground truth. But for us, and because nobody wants to create these painstakingly terrible ground truth data sets, they want a system that's automated to do this for them. So we pick the best model out there. We pick GPT-4. Let's assume GPT-4 knows the truth so we can get a handle on the RAG evaluation pipeline. Ideally, though, humans know the truth better. Of course, we have retrieval and generation in a RAG pipeline, and we can break it up into thinking about retrieval and generation. Retrieval breaks down into two different metrics. The first metric is called context precision. Answers the question, how relevant is the context to the question, right? Context recall answers the question, is the retriever able to retrieve all relevant context? And you might notice we're dealing with precision and recall. Classic ML practitioners should probably feel pretty comfortable with this. Now, on the generation side, there's a couple of other metrics. We'll take a closer look at each of these four metrics in the subsequent slides. During generation, we're going to compute two things. The first is answer relevancy. Answers the question. How relevant is the answer to the question, right? Better be pretty relevant because otherwise it's definitely wrong. And the faithfulness answer, this is the fake news metric, right? This is, is the answer fact checkable? Is this thing hallucinating? Is this thing confabulating? Is this thing something I can trust? No fake news. Is it faithful, right? Sticking with faithfulness, here's an example to make it more concrete in your mind. And this is how faithfulness score is calculated. Number of claims that can be inferred from given context divided by total number of claims in the generated answer. So here's an example. Question, where and where, and where was Einstein born? I believe... That was a typo in documentation from the Ragus guys. Where and when was Einstein born? 
context. Albert Einstein, born 14 March 1879, was a German-born theoretical physicist, widely held to be one of the greatest. Great, thank you. Great context. High faithfulness answer. Einstein was born in Germany. Got it. 14 March 1879. Got it. Low faithfulness. It lies to us, right? Easy enough. Of course, this is an open source tool and, you know, um, more help with docs is something that we'd love all of our community members to support for all of these great tools that come out and that uh, certainly the small teams that create them need help with. So the answer relevancy metric here, we're going to measure how relevant the, the generated answer is to the input, to the prompt. And it's important to understand that it doesn't consider factuality per se, but instead it penalizes cases where the answer lacks completeness or contains redundant details. So where is France and what is its capital? Low relevance. France is in Western Europe, right? It's like talking to one of those people that's like, answers half of your question, kind of like we did to Manny earlier, LOL. Those are some epic questions though. High relevance answer, answers both pieces. France is in Western Europe and Paris is its capital, right? Easy enough. Moving on at a high level here. Context precision is measuring the relevancy of the retrieved context to the prompt. Now check this out. We've got Precision at K, this is true positive over true positive plus false positive, classic precision, where context precision is now divided by total number of relevant items in the top K results. So it's a metric that evaluates whether all of the ground truth relevant items are presented in the contexts and they're ranked accordingly high if they're more and more relevant. So ideally, all the relevant chunks are in the top ranks, right? The more relevant, the higher it should be ranked. Makes sense? It's exactly the way you would write a paper. You would start it off with the most relevant things at the front end. Okay, what about context recall? Context recall is measuring recall of the retrieved context. Here, it's the ground truth sentences that can be attributed to the context divided by the total number of sentences in the ground truth, right? So the idea is if it's super true, we definitely want it in the ground truth and we want to be able to retrieve it during retrieval of reference material. Question, where is France and what is its capital? Ground truth, France is in Western Europe and its capital is Paris. A high context recall might look like France and Western Europe encompasses medieval cities, alpine villages, and Mediterranean beaches. Paris, its capital, is famed for its fashion houses, classical art museums, including the Louvre and monuments like the Eiffel Tower. Low context. What are we doing again here? France and Western Europe encompasses medieval cities, blah, 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 alpine villages. Good, good, good. The country is also renowned, blah, 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 last cows. Again, it's blowing off the capital right? It's not giving me a necessarily relevant sentence here. It's providing context, but it's not necessarily super relevant context. And so we want to see only, again, the most relevant context. So this is measuring the extent to which the retrieved context aligns with the annotated answer, aka the ground truth. And context precision is going to measure the relevancy. It used to be called context relevancy, but they changed the name to context precision. And this context 
We already covered context precision. This is a duplicate slide. So from context precision and context recall. Oh, yeah, we're gonna go ahead and mute that one. Context precision, context recall, our retriever. Hey, yo, man. And faithfulness and answer relevancy are generator metrics. So the retrieval system overall, you might consider as being measurable by context precision and context recall. The generator metrics you might use to sort of get an idea of how your generations are improving, how much they're hallucinating. But realistically, what's the whole big idea of RAG? It's get references, find relevant ones, shove them into the prompt context, and improve generation. So it's probably more valuable to try to improve, improve your retriever to thus improve generations. So if you're going to aim at something, we would recommend aiming at the retriever, which is what we'll show you how to do today. Some examples here of context. This is in their docs as well. Context relevancy is now context precision. You can see these numbers, um, how they look associated with any given type of question, answer, contexts, and ground truth. So you can get some idea of the way that this kind of might improve the answer with better contexts, you might be able to. Yeah, I guess we're gonna have to remove person. Um, all right, so in the RAG evaluation, Pipeline, you're essentially talking about four different metrics, context precision, context recall, answer relevancy, faithfulness. For this particular demonstration we've got today, we're using GBT 3.5 Turbo to generate an answer, and we're using GBT 4 to generate the ground truth. And this whole setup, we're going to show you the numbers before we close up for the day, but we're going to show you how to get this set up and how to get some initial baseline numbers, which is going to be the most important first step to take uh, right now as we do RAG on RAG with Ragus. Chris, over to you, man. That's right. We are We are doing like RAG nesting dolls here. So we're going to do... Ragus on rag with rag. It's going to be crazy. First step, though, uh, we need to, you know, create a, a data set of some kind. So what we're going to do is we're going to use our uh, response schema output parser, as well as our structured output parser from Langchain. Basically, this is just going to get us a question in an object with the key question. The description is going to be, a question about the context. And then we're going to save that into our list of question schemas. You'll notice that we have this structured output parser, and then we have a uh, get format instructions. Now, what this is going to do is it's going to pass GPT-4, a prompt that's going to encourage it to output our response in the above requested schema. So this is a useful pattern, like outside of even uh, you know, this particular case, if you want your responses to conform to a specific schema. Now, uh, we're going to pass in this prompt along with some context as our QA template. We're going to say, you're a university professor creating a test for advanced students, you know, create some questions. The idea here is that in order to evaluate we need to provide these triplets of questions, answers, and contexts. And so we're going to have the LLM generate our questions from our contexts and then provide answers to the questions from those contexts. So we'll start the process by doing this uh, right here, making this chat template, adding those format instructions, 
and then sending that to the LLM. Notice that we have the question, what is the main focus of the paper, a survey on retrieval augmented text generation? And the context is a blurb from the paper that explains and contains the abstract of that title. So the idea is we have a piece of context and now we have a question that should be answerable given that context. We're gonna do this for 10 prompts because uh, to do this for, it's gonna cost uh, many tokens to do this. So please be aware of costs. Uh, doing it on a small subset is going to be an okay place to get started for uh, evaluation. Uh, if you want to take this further, uh, obviously you'll have to talk to your organization. What I can tell you is that it will cost a bit, but it will cost much less than getting humans to do a similar task. So uh, that's always great. Next, we repeat this exact same process, but for answers. You'll notice you, we have now you are a university professor creating a test for advanced students. For each question and context, create an answer. We're going to pass in our users questions, our uh, our context that were used to create those questions, and then we're going to get the LLM to produce an answer built from the question and context pair. Again, we're going to uh, look at an example. The main focus of the paper, a survey on retrieval augmented text generation is conduct a survey, but retrieval augmented, it goes on and on. But the idea is that this answer is an answer to the question we created earlier with the provided context. And that's all we're doing. We again create 10 answers to our questions. And then we wrap this all into a data set. Now that we have the data set, we are able to start thinking about using Ragus. So the way that we're going to do this is by having this create Ragus data set option. Because remember, our answers that we have are considered the ground truth answers, but we need to evaluate our LLM's answers to these questions, right? So we have our ground truth. We need to have our LLM produce the actual answers. So we're going to use the uh, create uh, Ragus data set to do this you'll see the RAG pipeline is going to take the query at question, and then we're going to add the answer in our data set uh, from our actual LLM. So this is the response generated from the model that we're evaluating. Basic idea here, we're going to have our model get the same context and the same question and see how it does. And we're going to compare the two results at the end to get our RAGUS metrics. So here's our evaluate RAGUS data set. You'll see here that we have uh, a few metrics we care about that Greg has discussed with us, context precision, faithfulness, answer relevancy, and context recall. Also, one thing to notice, we're passing in the context that we obtained. So we're not just evaluating the model's ability to generate correct or factual responses. We're also evaluating the performance of our actual retrieval pipeline. Is it retrieving the correct contexts? Are the contexts relevant to the answer and the query, and so on? So let's uh, look. You know, we just create that data set. It's got ten rows, and then we save it for later. And then we evaluate how it did. It goes through a whole process. It does take a while. Uh, it's got to answer ten questions and then evaluate four metrics for each of them. And you'll see that we get this basic QA result, which has a full Ragus score of zero point two two a context relevancy score of 0 0.07, a faithfulness score of 0 0.6 second, an answer relevancy of 0 0.99, that's high, that's great, and then a context recall of 0 0.8667. So we have a few different things that we can shift around here, but we want to focus on improving, you know, kind of a metric at a time. And the metric that we want to improve is we want to correct, collect better context for our model so we're going to use some uh, different retrievers and see how that impacts our Ragus score. So this retriever is just going to be our uh, uh, kind of like our QA chain factory, right? We're going to pass in our chat OpenAI model. We're going to hold the LLM to be the same. And then the only thing we're going to change is this retriever between the different pipelines, right? So we can plug in new retrievers, but everything else should remain constant since we're trying to test our retriever specifically. The first kind of like fancy retriever we're going to use is the parent document retriever. Now, the way this works is 
imagine that you have a page and on that page, there are five paragraphs. The way the parent document retriever is gonna work is it will search through each paragraph present in your corpus, but it's gonna return the full page. So why might this be useful? Well, let's say for instance, uh, this is an example that uh, someone from our uh, LMO cohort uh, worked on, right? Which is this idea of like an equation, right? If I search for Bernoulli's equation, and I just rely on the text, I'm not going to get Bernoulli's equation. I'm going to get a paragraph that describes that Bernoulli's equation is either coming up or we just saw it. So the way that we improve that is we expand the window around what we find in order to, in order to better capture relevant information. So when we search for Bernoulli's equation, Along with the paragraph that explains that we either just saw it or are about to see it, we also capture the equation and we're able to ensure that we capture more information. And obviously this extends to many other examples, but that's just a, you know, one that's, that's uh, top of mind. So you'll notice that our parent uh, documents are in chunk size of 2000s and our uh, child documents are in chunk sizes of 400. These are hyperparameters that you can play with. Um, so, you know, you might find it to be better to even search even smaller chunks uh, and then blow up uh, a little bit less or blow up even more. It's all about uh, what's easiest for you. And I'll, I'll link this again uh, for people who are just joining. The idea is we can use Langchain, though, to simplify the actual creation of this. So we create our parent splitter. We create our child splitter. We create our vector store with the collection name split parents and our OpenAI embedding function, and then we create an in-memory store. Now, one thing you might have noticed, if we're only searching for the child documents using dense vector retrieval, then we shouldn't actually need to uh, embed the parent documents, right? We, we never search directly for the parent documents. So indeed, all we need to do is store them in memory. Uh, and that's why we use the in-memory store for our parent documents. As you can see here, we have our doc store, which is our in-memory store, our vector store, which is our chroma DB, and our child and parent splitter. Our child documents will wind up in the vector store, and our parent documents will wind up in the doc store. They will be associated behind the scenes, so each child document is associated with a uh, parent document. All we have to do now is feed in our docs, and it's going to take care of the rest. And now we can create a new chain. Again, we're going to use the create QA chain uh, helper function that we uh, built above, and we're going to pass in this specific retriever, and that's all we have to do. Now we can ask a question, what is RAG? And we get RAG stands for Retrieval Augmented Generation, it is, and it goes on and on. It gives the answer. That's good. So now let's use this new chain with the parent document retriever, and let's evaluate it using RAGUS. And we'll find that our Context relevancy score is perhaps, uh, you know, uh, leaves something to be desired. Our faithfulness is quite high. Our answer relevancy is relatively untouched. And our context recall has improved some. The next uh, retrieval method we're going to try, right, because we want to see which is the best of these methods, uh, is the ensemble retriever. Now, we've talked a lot today about dense vector search, which is this idea of comparing dense embedding vectors of passages of text and determining their semantic relatedness using some distance measure like cosine similarity. Well, instead uh, of that, we're going to combine that dense vector search with a sparse uh, search. So we're going to use the BM25 search method, which is much closer to a bag of words style uh, search. So it's more caring about what words are in the uh, in the query versus what words are in our documents. And the idea here is that we collect a number of documents from both of the search methods, and then we re-rank them using the uh, reciprocal rank fusion algorithm, uh, which is you can read about in, a, in the paper. It's pretty cool. The idea is it's going to fuse these two disparate uh, uh, relevancy searches into one ordered uh, uh entity so that we have some, you know, top K results. If we retrieved, say, in this case, four, but we're only actually going to keep three, it would order the results by relevancy such that we drop the least relevant between the two. 
Um, it's just a cool algorithm to combine two different uh, collection methods. You'll notice that there's this weights hyperparameter. So we can actually prefer one or the other. So if we know that we need some level of keyword-esque search or sparse search, but we don't want to weight it too highly, uh, we can shift this to 0 0.25 and 0 0.75. As long as these numbers sum to one, you're, uh, you're chilling. The idea here is that we're going to do these two search methods and then combine their resulting uh, documents into one ordered list and then choose from the top of that. And again, we ask the same question and we get another great answer. Feels good. We're going to set up the same Ragus data set that we did before, but this time using the Ensemble Retriever. We're going to uh, essentially mark this as it goes through. And then we're going to go and look at our total results in order. And we can kind of see that generally our basic QA result, while it was quite decent on uh, some of the metrics, you know, our the faithfulness kind of fell behind, uh, the answer relevancy kind of fell behind. And with our more advanced methods, we were able to uh, boost our faithfulness and our answer relevancy. We didn't take too much of a hit on context recall, but we did take a hit on context relevancy. And so what this means is while we are retrieving more and more uh, more documentation that makes our answer, uh, makes it so that we're answering closer to the source documentation, we are in fact retrieving uh, more information than we necessarily need to answer the question. And so that's a improvement we could seek to make in the next iteration, right? Perhaps we could tweak the hyperparameters relating to how many documents we're retrieving with each pipeline. But overall, we're happy to see that our system in some capacity improved and gave us better results than just the basic retrieval method, which is fantastic. And this is the idea of Ragus. It helps us to understand how changes we're making to our retrieval uh, and generation pipelines actually impact our uh, our end results. Uh, now again, this is all this is all by AI, right? So AI is answering the questions and asking the questions. Obviously, you can substitute humans and any part of this. Uh, if you have domain experts, you could have them generate uh, these questions and answers based on the contexts. Uh, but this is a way we can do it without having to spend those resources on, on very expensive humans. So uh, can we use Llama Index for the same capabilities? Is not yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, Llama Index has analogs to all of these uh, that you can leverage if you want to stay in Llama Index's ecosystem. Yeah. All right. Awesome. We just saw Rag on Rag with Ragus, and we're gonna go ahead and recap recap exactly what Chris was talking about here. And get this dialed in here. The way to take RAG to the next level is to get it set up, right? Generally, if you're doing this in production, like cache is king. You don't want to be redoing things like recreating all of your embeddings in your vector database all the time or rerunning and inferencing prompts that you've already gotten in the past. But outside of that, it's very easy, as we saw, to go ahead and pick up an ensemble retriever that helps us do a quick re-ranking. To do really next level builds, go ahead and set it up, instrument it with evaluation, start looking at things like chunk sizes, chunk overlap, get into that black art of chunking, and really look at doing some interesting hierarchical metadata, hybrid retrieval stuff, You know, maybe even add some quantitative data as we've seen earlier. Chris showed the parent document retriever with the big idea, right? Small docs are good, but big docs are good too, right? So why not just use both? We saw that uh, children split parents in the child document receiver uh, retriever as sometimes they do in this world. And the ensemble retriever was essentially this way to, you know, take a bunch of references and to then down select to the only top references. And so we're kind of using this interesting idea of a sparse retrieval plus a dense retrieval when we're doing this kind of ensemble. And a lot of the vector databases today have this built in, but here 
we're going ahead and we're just leveraging this tool directly in Langchain rather than using like a pine cone that is going to do this out of the box, for instance. So that's meta rag with Ragus and advanced retrieval. What did we see at the end of the day? We saw that when we measured context recall from the base model to the parent document retriever to the ensemble model. And remember, context recall is ground truth sentences that can be attributed to the context divided by the total number of sentences in the ground truth. So it's about not just getting the right stuff, but getting the right amount of the right stuff. We saw an improvement with each of these additional retrieval capabilities. Not really surprising if you think about the way these are operating. So with that, Ragus is uh, pretty dope. It's leading the way. Retriever metrics include context precision, context recall, generation metrics include answer relevancy, faithfulness. It's not really cost effective in general, unless you compare it to like humans doing it. So beware of setting these things up and just like smashing your OpenAI API key way too much. And the eval is definitely evolving. Like you're going to see in the next session, there's actually built in tools now in Llama Index that you can do eval out of the box. So, you know, to the question of do it in Langchain or Llama Index, you know, it's like, well, you can instrument either one with Ragus, but they're also coming out with their own metrics to be able to measure these things in just one line of code within that infrastructure tool. So lots of interesting stuff happening in the eval space. Very, very cool to be able to build, at least with this tool, even since we started teaching this, the Ragus team at Exploding Gradients has made a ton of updates to the tool and to the documentation. Watch these guys. It's a great open source project to potentially contribute to. And, um, and that's it for RAG eval, state of the art, chativersary, year one, 2023. Next up, we've got fine tuning of embeddings. We're actually going to do some measuring using some evaluation tools of the real improvement we get from that fine tuning of the embeddings. So check that out coming up next in session eight. That's a wrap.